<clears throat> now, many of you should not become teachers, brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body. If we put bits into the mouth of horses so they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ship also. Though they are, lo- they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder. Wherever the will of the pilot, uh, pilot directs, so also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a force is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life set on fire by hell, but every kind of beast, bird, reptile, sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human, hear this now, can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the image of God. For the same, from the same mouth comes blessing and curses. Brothers and sisters, these things ought not be so. Does it spring forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can fig trees, my brothers, bear olives or grapevines produce figs? Neither can salt pond yield fresh water. May the Lord have a blessing to the hearers, to the readers, but most of all, the doers of his word. Father, I come now in this hour. May you be glorified and may you be magnified. May we be sensitive to what you have to tell us about our tongue. And so may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And we all together in voice said, amen. There was a frog who wanted to get across this great lake, but knew that he would not have the ability to get across. And so he starts to think, how is it that he can get across the lake because it is so vast and he knows he does not have the endurance and ability to get across. So he's thinking, what can he do? And all of a sudden he sees two birds having conversation in a tree and he thinks to himself, he, he says, I have an idea. Hey, would you be willing to help me? And the bird said, yes, we will. Frog, what do you need? He said, if you could just, one of you can grab the end of this twig and then I will hold on with my mouth. You can carry me across the pond. The bird said, actually, this is pretty brilliant. We didn't know a frog could think like this. And so they proceeded to do what was impossible and they're flying across. And as they're flying across the lake to get this frog to the other side, a man who is near fishing sees this uh, two birds and frog here holding with his mouth. And he is amazed. He goes, wow, who came up with this idea? Who thought of that? And immediately the frog opened his mouth and said, I. (laughs) Well, I think you understand where I'm going. When we open our mouth at the wrong time, it can cause great damage. And so that's what we're going to look at here today in this text is how do we control our tongue? How do we control our speech? You see, there's 10 constitutions in the United States here. And the first amendment of these constitutions consists of five freedoms that protect us. And the one that is in there that we know the most is what? Freedom of speech. Here's what's very interesting with the Constitution. The Constitution, actually, it protects your freedom of speech, meaning that you don't have to be a legal age to benefit from this. In fact, the moment that you are born, before you can utter a word, you have the First Amendment. In fact, even if you are not of this country, if you are in the country, you can still benefit from the First Amendment. You see, it, 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 this, 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 this freedom that is supposed to protect our speech, it gives us an opportunity to, to, to speak to political change, to social changes, and, or we can even oppose those things here. 
I mean, that's one thing, if I'm being honest, that makes America great is that we have the freedom to speak and say what we want, when we want, how we want, and no one can dictate that. I mean, come on, this is the, this is the U.S. Constitution. It's what governs us. Who can trump such uh, uh, the, the Constitution that is ingrained into this country? Well, I know one. One who existed before time, one who existed before the Constitution. Yes, although the Constitution does give you the freedom to speak and say what you want, hear me, God orchestrates and should control what you say if you are a believer. And so here's what I'm trying to say here. I'm not against our Constitution. However, your speech should not be governed more by the Constitution of the United States versus the Constitution of God's Word. You ain't got to say amen. But the reality of it is we live in a world where we govern our speech by the Constitution and you can't tell me anything. And yet God's word becomes second. And we say his Constitution doesn't matter because it's what I say. I live in America. I submit to you today that although we pledge our allegiance here and this is a good country, this is not here a history lesson. I submit to you today your allegiance is to the Lord first before anything else. Because the Bible tells us that we are citizens here, our home is not here, and we have a new heaven and new earth come. So I submit to you today, be governed by God's word and not by the constitution of this world. Because we're going to see here today, our speech has power. And so what am I saying here? Control your tongue, control your speech. Why? Because there is death and life in your tongue. We're going to get to the text. But it's true. It's true here. What we're going to see is we're going to see three movements here in James chapter three, when it talks about this taming of the tongue. And the first movement we're going to see is really simplistic. These all come from this text. It's the tongue is small, but it's powerful. Notice here in James chapter one, he starts off, he says, not many of you ought to be teachers. Because there will be a greater, there'll be a stricter judgment that comes to you. But what's beautiful about when you look into the text James, is all, James, although he is talking to teachers now, verses 2 drops us. It, uh, it, it's a net that catches everybody because now James doesn't use just a, 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 those who are gifted as teachers, but now he uses plural language. He says, we all stumble in many ways. What is he saying? He's saying our speech, we all have some imperfection in there. He says, in fact, that if we stumble... In many ways, he says, we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, perfect woman, able to bridle, able to control the whole body. Now, I would like to take a test here. Raise your hand or stand up if you are perfect and never slipped in your speech. So I believe that this word is for every last one of us here. Because hear this, this is true. Whether you are a quiet person or one of few words, Or whether you have many words, wherever you fall yourself, get this. Our imperfections, our imperfections and our sinfulness does come through the sinfulness of our tongue. It does because we're imperfect. I understand that you were mommy and daddy's precious child that never made a mistake, or you have siblings that think that you are the perfect child, but hear me, wherever you are today, introvert, extrovert, many words, few words, you have imperfection, and yet imperfection is seen in your speech. And so he says here, it's small, but it's boast of many things. It's powerful here. Understand the words have power. Why do we know that? Because if you go look at Genesis chapter one, and then even if you look at Hebrews chapter three, that talks about God's word. What happened is God spoke this word in this world into existence. He spoke it. And hear this now, that's real power. And he gives that power to us. Why? Because we are created in his image and in his likeness. Which means our words have power too. Get this, out of all the creatures that were created, we are the only ones. Humanity has the ability to communicate through spoken word. And it is the power, uh, the, the use of these words are unique and they're powerful and they are a gift from God. 
But how many of you all know that got distorted? Because what did Satan attack in the Garden of Eden? He attacked the very words of God and therefore caused Eve to think and miss up this. And let me say this real quick. I got to say this real quick. Here's it. Eve get a lot of slack. But hear me now. Adam was present. And so this is not a mere thing of saying just be silent because we see that Adam's silence of his word actually caused sin to enter the world here. So I'm not calling you to be silent in that talk. Some of us, that's impossible. It'll never happen. I, me, I'm a preacher. Why you think? I talk a lot. So here I am. But it's real though. A tool is a beautiful thing. When you have a tool, it can do great things. It can build beautiful structures. But when you use that tool incorrectly, it can be great. It can bring great destruction. It can cause buildings to collapse because you're using a tool and it's not used in its proper way or you misuse it accordingly. The same is true with our words. We can, our words tear down. Our words build up. Our words, get this, create actions, good and bad. Why? Because our words matter. There's power in our words. Here's two truths I want to encourage us that can help us to control our speech. James says in verse one, he says, many of you ought not to be teachers. Why? Because there's become a, there's a stricter judgment that's coming. You will be judged and get this. It's not just the teachers and the preachers, which should deter us to be slow to speak. But we see in Matthew chapter 12, he sits here and Jesus says, it's not on the board, but here he says, but I tell you, that man will give an account on the day of judgment. Get this, for every careless word they have spoken, for by the words you have been acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. So one that should keep us to control our tongue, one truth is that judgment is coming. And you will stand before the Father yourself, and you will give an account for every careless word that you have spoken here. That's not to scare you, but that should cause us to tighten up a little bit. But secondly, the other truth is that it shows, controlling the tongue shows that we can, it's evidence that we can control, get this, our personality. We show a little bit of self-control. And dare I say, controlling our tongue shows us a little bit of our maturity. Knowing when to say it, not to say it, how to say it. The tongue is small. but it's strong. It can be guided. And here's what's important. You need to know this. The very words, the reason why this matters so much, your, very, your salvation depended upon your words. If you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, the words that you confess saved you and changed the trajectory of your eternal State. So what makes you think that our words don't have power? We're not powerful like that. It's the Holy Spirit that moves through it that uses that, though. But here's what I want us to say. This. I think this is important. I'm not concluding that we're doomed in, in, in our instructions. You know, we can't, our, our speech is now instruments of discourse, and you can never do anything. That's not, that's not what I'm getting at. No, no, that's not. But what we can see is that God has the ability to mold an abusive tongue. To mold a destructive tongue. If you find yourself one that says, I just can't help myself. If you find yourself struggling with your language, hear me. We serve a God that is able to take that force of venom and use it for a force of good. Why? Because he did that on the work of the cross. He did that on the cross for us all. It is the spirit that is inside of us. And so the Bible doesn't call us to be silent. It's not what he's saying. But the tongue ought to be empowered by the Holy Spirit and to bring glory to God is what we ought to do here. And so as we talk about this to wrap it up, the tongue is small, but it is powerful. But then James wants us to see some honest truths when it comes to our tongue. We have to be real with it. We have to be real with it. He says in verses 5b to, five, uh, to, to verse 8, he says the tongue is untamable. 
He even starts out, he says, how great a fire is set ablaze by a small thing, by small, uh, by, by small fires. We live in Colorado. That's not foreign. It's very dry here. You get forest fires. Why? It doesn't, it doesn't take much. A cigarette butt can set a whole course on fire. He says it sets on fire. And he says that here's what's crazy about this. He says the tongue, there's three things that it is. It corrupts the whole person. It corrupts the whole life. And it is influenced by Satan. Those are the three things that it says. With well, the first one, he says the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness, a world of evil here, meaning that it, the tongue corrupts and pollutes and defiles our entire personality. We got to be honest with this here. These words, it's not only just affecting them, but it corrodes us. We see the second one is that it sets the whole course on fire. I mean, the, the course of life on fire, meaning a misused tongue, a defiled tongue. It has, get this, in the, you have the secular uh, 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 struggling that takes place when your tongue is uncontrollable in your whole life. You find yourself getting in trouble because you just can't keep your mouth shut. You got relationships on fire because of your words. And this is something that we will deal with until Christ comes back. He's saying it, it sets the course of life on fire. And this is important. And we don't like to talk about this. But it says here at the last part of this verse, in verse 6, it's set on fire by hell. Which means that it describes the influence that Satan has on the tongue. The influence that Satan has on the words. You see, what's very interesting is that the text tells us that every created thing can be tamed. And we know there's, you know, hear me now, listen. There's people that control elephants and lions and bless their heart. I don't know why they do that in the fallen world. That doesn't make any sense. But by and large, you get what I'm saying. They're controlled. You can, it says the reptiles, creatures, sea creatures, they can be controlled by humanity. But it said the human being cannot tame the tongue. You cannot, in your own power, tame your speech. You can't. I don't care how sophisticated you are, how much degrees that you have, how influential you come from, or whether if you use Ebonic language and your, your verbs don't match like me, it does not matter. Find yourself on the spectrum. You cannot control your tongue by your own self, is what he's saying here. Because he describes the tongue and he says that it is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. What does that actually mean? What does it mean to be full of poison? What does it mean to be full of evil? Well, one theologian, I believe, cap and captured it very beautifully here. It says, every source of evil finds an ally in an uncontrolled tongue. Every source of evil finds an ally, get this, in an uncontrolled tongue. Have you ever found yourself, whether intentionally or accidentally, saying things you shouldn't have said? You ever been in a conversation with someone, it's getting a little heated, and you find yourself knowing in the moment, get this, you shouldn't have said it. Or before you even speak it, you shouldn't say it, but your pride won't let you control it. See, Satan knows how to influence you. And unfortunately, I find myself all the time, I tell my wife, when my wife and I get into it and we have disagreements, I've gotten better, but I still give dissertations. I used to give a lot of dissertations. <laughs> I, I was like, are you going to hear what I got to say? You going to hear me today. I've gotten better, y'all. 12 years of marriage now, you know, I've gotten better. I'm learning. Everything ain't got to be solved in that moment. You hear me? Um, but I find myself telling her, we say, we, 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 we tell each other, man, we took the bait of it. We took the bait of Satan, didn't we? Yeah, we did. Yeah, we did. Because you find yourself saying things that you wish you, you could bring them back in and wish you didn't say it. It's uncontrollable. And I think you got to acknowledge that here. But I want us to see the intentionality of how, how powerful our words is. God's word is living and active. Proverbs 18, verse 21 tells us, 
very clearly. It should be on the board here. There is death and life. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. You see that? And get this, family, that ain't rhetoric. That, 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 that's not just, uh, 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 it sounds good. That's real. You see, let's, let's, let, let's bring this down to, to reality a little bit. Let's talk about the physical, how these words um, can, can, can impact, how there's death and life in these words here. One, think about it. It's even in our court system. You go to court, you put your hand on the Bible, and what does it say? Do you swear to tell the whole truth? Nothing but the truth. So help you God. Why? Because. The very words that you are getting ready to take the stand can actually free someone or kill someone. Put someone in jail for a long time or let them free. See, the words have power because a doctor can recommend surgery that can actually save your life. A counselor talks to someone who is dealing with mental illness and the words of a counselor can actually help them not commit suicide. That's the physical here. And then you know that our words actually can bring about death. Do you know that most altercations that happen when they end in deadly force with a knife, with a gun, with murder, it all started with an argument. There was a disagreement of whatever it was and you had two people, one in themselves or both of them could not control themselves. And so what they decided to do was allow their sinfulness take the full course and somebody's life is lost. That's the physical here. But you know there's death and life also in the emotional emotional realm and also the spiritual realm. How you use your tongue. Look on the board here. Proverbs 15, verse 4. It says a gentle, some version says a healing tongue is a tree of life. A perver- uh, but perversiveness in it, in the tongue, get this, it, it breaks the spirit. This word breaks. It is one who crushes. It fractures. It shatters. Many of us right now can remember the moment that the words that someone said to us cut us so deep that we did not know if we were going to recover it because it most of all came from someone that was close to us. And you and I have an option, an opportunity for our tongues to be one of healing or one that crushes the spirit. And if we're honest, may we repent because oftentimes we want to crush what's in front of us. Because whether it's you don't like the person in front of us or get this, you trying to get to where you go, don't tell me what to do. My family of God, may that never be. What would romance be without love? Seriously. And here's this, get this, get this, get this. We send confusion amongst people because our actions say something and our words say something else. We would say, I love you, but yet treat them like hot garbage. Which we're going to get to that our heart, our tongue is a reflection of what's inside of us. But there's this spiritual realm that our tongue can do. It can bring life or it can crush life. I don't have to tell you I've been there. That myth, you, you remember this? Y'all, y'all know this one. Here we go. Sticks and stones. See, oh, come on. Y'all start laughing. Let's finish. Sticks and stones may what? But words will what? That's the lie from the pit of hell. That is a complete lie. Because how many of you all know you break a bone, it can heal in four, it can heal in six weeks. But the words can fracture somebody for years. So I don't believe this little nursery rhyme or whatever it came from because That's real family of God. There is death and life in your tongue. And many of us are carrying around the wounds of the words that someone spoke to us years ago that cuts deep to the core. And I don't want to sit here and act like we all victims. Some of us have caused the wounds of people that are carrying for years. 
But it is what Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, where he says that don't let any unwholesome talk come from out of your mouth, but that which builds up. So you want to know what death looks like here. This word unwholesome that he talks about is really translated as rotten or, 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 or that is foul. It's rotten. Whether it's vulgar jokes, whether it's dirty jokes, whether it's foul language that should not in any way be part of the speech of a believer. Period, point blank. Whether in public or even in private. And so when he talks about this unwholesomeness that comes out of the mouth, get this here. I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but I need to say this here. The bitter heart brings stinging words. The self-righteous heart brings judgmental words. And get this, the thankless heart brings many complaints. Hurtful words, criticisms, the hatred, the failure, the negativity. Get this, all this hopelessness will, get this, eventually produce Death, the Bible tells us with the sinner's mouth, it's like an open grave. Yeah. Tells us in Romans that the, full, that the full course of sin is in our mouth. Unwholesome talk shouldn't come from us. Many of us got more body counts than someone has killed physically because we just weaponize our words, which in way, because we don't care about what's in front of us. All we care about is healing our own self, making sure we're right here. There's death and life in the tongue family. Are you storing it at that well? That bitterness that doesn't get handled just only causes more fire. It says it's small. James said, wow, how great a fire, how great a force fire, how great a force is set on fire by the small tongue. Those things are what speak death. When you, when you speak death, when you have uncontrollable tongues here, but on the flip side, you want to speak life to some folks. You want to give some hope. You want to give some encouragement. You want to give some edifying words. You want to give support here. I don't know anybody that doesn't want to speak life to someone, nor do I don't, you know, anybody that won't like, that don't want life speak to, to them. Colossians 4 tells us, let our conversation be full of grace and seasoned with salt so that we know how to answer everyone. The Bible tells us that we ought to be ready to give an answer for the hope for which we believe in. Our aim, our goal as believers is to build up, not to tear down. Because God built you up. When nobody else wanted to build you up, God built you up. God looked upon you even when you whiplashed God because he didn't move the way that you wanted to move, yet he did not forsake you. Yet he does not abandon you. And may I be remiss, his word never changes. But yet here we are, as fickle people as we are, got the nerves not to speak life to someone, all because they look at us differently. Treat us differently. Your speech is not predicated on how somebody acts towards you. Because at the end of the day, I'm not minimizing the hurt. You have a responsibility with your mouth, not them. Because you're going to give an account for what you say, not them. I'm not excusing it. Some people say some messed up stuff. They do. I'm not excusing it. But in the moment, you have an opportunity. Well, my, I, I can use this mouth to, to crush this spirit or I can use it as a healing Get this, even if you disagree with him. Well, you say, Pastor, does that mean we can't critique them? We can't offer constructive criticism? No, that's not what I'm saying. You can build people up. You can be honest with what you feel. I'm not saying don't speak when someone wronged you or anything. That's not, that's, that's not what I'm saying. But you can go about it in a, healthy, in a helpful way. You can put some grace on it. We've talked about it all the time. We just we want to give truth with no grace. Man, I think I think I think God, I think God for, for, for my wife. When I first got married, I grew up in a house, man, where we, we say whatever we want to say. And we say it, we really we say, well, I can't say whatever I want to say. I grew up with a black mama, she hit me in my mouth and she'll shut me straight real quick. <laughs> If I even look, if I got to look like I'm about to say something disrespectful, she already saying, what you about? Listen, I already knew nothing, mama, nothing. <laughs> and then when I got of age, I started getting little muscles. It wasn't no belt. She wanted to hit me with the fist and all that stuff. Listen, man, it, it's not child abuse. Some of us don't, kids don't get whoopings these days. I'm just saying, <laughs> I'm grateful for my parents, you know. But I grew up in a household where we get to pretty much say what we want to say. Or, or, or well, not, I, I, um, 
I'm going to say it how I feel is what I'm saying, right? As you know, I, I'm, I, 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 I am a, an emotional person. I'm passionate. I speak intensely. Even in conversations, sometimes my wife is like, bro, I'm right here. Why are you so loud? <laughs> like, we're, we're two feet apart. Why? You know. But I remember when we got married, she told me one thing. Because we had two worlds that came together. You have a very outspoken family, and you have a very quiet family in her family that's really more gentle. And she used to tell me all the time, she goes, Miguel, I don't care what you say. It's how you say it. She would tell me all the time. She was like, I don't care how right you are. But if, you, if, if, you, if your delivery is off, ain't nobody receiving nothing. And I didn't want to hear it. But by the grace of God, I've changed over the course of life. Sure, do I stumble? Absolutely. But what I'm telling you is that oftentimes, I'm not saying you can't offer critique. It's how you deliver it, family. And then you give it to them and let the Lord deal with them. You ain't got to sit there and try to convince people. I'm going to stop right there. (laughs) I can say a lot right there. I could have saved ourselves a lot of, our our arguments could have been a lot short. See, am I not right? If I would have just left it there, right? But the Bible says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Can't do it. We got to solve it tonight. No, give that space. You bet. If anybody's about to get married, give some space. Take 24 hours. Dress it later. You will thank me. You will, will, your conversation will go a lot better. Um, But hear this. I want to address this before I move on too. So am I saying you can't critique? No, I'm not saying that. But also too, we live in a world where we talk about this manifesting. I speak things into existence and it can be. There's this, there's this thing going around where it says, I can speak, I can bring things into existence. No, you can't. No, you can't. You can't manifest. Your words do not have power. The last time I checked, only God is the one that brought nothing, brought something from nothing. Excuse me. Not us. That's good. And that's what's been detrimental in the church, especially the prosperity movement, where it's like, speak it, name it, claim it. Listen, the only way you want to see your word come back tenfold is if you ask the things of God. Because the Bible says that if you ask, get this, he will give. But oftentimes we stop that asking. Go look at the Bible. Go, go, go be the scholars that you are here. Listen, is that anywhere when associated with ask, closely to it is always tethered to his will and his desire. And so you can see things come into be if you're asking according to his way and his will and his word. Don't get caught up thinking that you can just manifest things. Don't do that. Because I'm going to just be honest, you manifested the wrong thing and you're going to get attacked by some demonic stuff. Hear me. You keep, you keep, listen. Don't underestimate. Don't do that. The enemy wants, to, wants you to think that won't nothing happen to you. But you got to be mindful and intentional. You can't manifest nothing. Because although you are a believer, if you confess Jesus, yes, you cannot be possessed. You cannot be possessed or controlled by a uh, demonic, uh, by, by a demon. But guess what? You sure can be influenced by them. Some of us was influenced with them last night. You ain't got to say amen. They put that bait in front of them and we took it. I'm not trying to discourage you. I'm just trying to be real. So don't dismanifest and stuff. We can't do that. We don't have the ability to do that. Only God is the one that can speak things to be. He can bring them about. He has that power to manifest, not us, not ourselves. But it's our job to emulate Christ. So we see how the tongue is small, but it's powerful. We see here, we just spent a little bit of time, how the tongue is untamable, how it can't be tamed by any human being here. We talked about the life and death that's in the power of the tongue and what this looked like. The last that I want to spend our time to look at is where you get from the remaining part of the text. It says that the tongue, get this, reveals the heart. It reveals the heart. It says in verse 9, with it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the image of God. Blessings and curses come from our mouth. We praise God, but get this. When you try to cut someone with your words, it's not them. 
It, it is them that you are cutting and, and hurting and wounding and crushing. But ultimately, it's God that you're doing it. So you're really praising God, but also cursing God. Because you're attacking the very thing that was created in his image. So you're really going after the object itself on both sides, which means we are being hypocritical and double-minded. And the text, he goes on to say, he gives, this, he gives this, um, these analogies. He says salt water and clean water can't come from the open, same spout. They can't. You won't see fig trees produce grapevines. You won't see apple trees produce oranges. You get the, he said, that's, that, 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 doesn't make, that doesn't make sense. They contradict one another. So much so it contradicts just even the natural laws of life because he says, brothers and sisters, this should not even be. Yeah. This shouldn't even be. And we know that what is connect, our words is connected to our heart because this is not on the board here, but it's in Matthew chapter 12. He talks about this. He says, get this. He says, a good man brings good things out of, uh, out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man and a woman brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. It says, for out of the mouth, it says, for the mouth speak what the heart is full of. If you are, or you have heard it another way, the, uh, uh, out, of the, uh, the, out of the mouth, the abundance of the heart speak. You ever want to know who somebody is, just listen to what they say. I am learning in life, believe what somebody tells you. If they start talking a certain way, you start seeing actions ain't matched up, get this. That doesn't mean, and what God is talking about is that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. He's not talking, Jesus is not addressing talking about you, you don't have mishaps. We, all, we already established that at the very beginning. We all stumble in many ways, and particularly in our speech. But what, he, what, what, what he's getting at in, in Matthew chapter 12, what Jesus says that if there is a consistency in their speech and their actions that is, is showing the good or showing the evil, believe what is being seen. Oftentimes we love people so much and we, get, and we cause so much turmoil because we like to live in this benefit of the doubt moment. Well, we just want to give them the benefit of the doubt. So much good has come from them. Believe who they say they are. Believe who they show you to be. What you talk about, how you speak, your language on a consistent basis shows what is on the throne of your heart. Is it the world or is it God? Because from here, there's going to be an overflow that comes out. And, 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 and get this. And I know sometimes we, you know how it is. We, we, we say things, like, oh, oh, no, I didn't mean that. Yes, you did. And so I just want us to be understanding that your, your, your tongue, your speech really reflects what's in here. And so only you know what gets to say, only you know what's really in here. And so what I want you to do as you look at this is start believing who people say they are when they speak. Because they're mad, get this, you're, you're, there should not be a contradiction in your proclamation and your, in, in, your, in, in your actions. There shouldn't be a contradiction in that. That's right. But we've done so great, great of a damage because we say God's words here and yet it doesn't match with action. Out of the mouth, out of the heart, uh, uh, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks here. But hear me as we get ready to wrap this up. One of the things I want to encourage you, and this is real, is you got to stop talking to yourself like you're worthless. You say things, I'm worthless. No one cares about me. And, 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 and I'm not talking about, <laughs> I'm not talking about in the moment when you're, when you're having a conversation, you upset and you don't get no, get your way. And nobody cares about what I say. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when you're in your car, when you're sitting on the edge of your bed and it's dark and you ain't turned the lights on yet, or you're laying there on your back, looking up at the ceiling and you tell yourself that no one cares about you, or you tell yourself, I hate my life, or, you know, I'm, 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 I'm worthless, Don't believe the lie of the enemy. And if you know someone that says that, whether it's you who say these words or you know someone who says this, hear me, this is a beautiful opportunity to do exactly what Jesus has done. Jesus came, it talks about in Luke 4, where he, 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 he paraphrases Isaiah, but Jesus came to set the captives free. 
He came to recover sight for the blind, freedom from the oppressed. Why? Listen, family of God, God uses our words as a conduit to speak life and change the trajectory of people. So if you are someone here today that speaks negatively about yourself, I'm not trying to get you into this positive thinking. No, you're valuable because the Lord loves you. You're valuable because the Lord sees you. Yeah, you made some mistakes. Yeah, you've done some messed up things. I get that. But that's the beauty of the gospel is that you cannot out God's grace. You just got to be willing to repent. You got to be willing to change course in life. And it's there ready available for you to receive. And family of God, I'm going to submit to you today. I want to challenge you. Don't just let people talk about themselves any kind of old way. Start speaking life to people. Because God has placed you in that person's life for a strategic moment so that he can use your words as a vessel to bring life from that. Get this, even in the midst of your pain and struggle, you can speak life. How do I know? Because Jesus did it on the cross. He, if you go back and look at the gospel accounts, there's two things that we know that Jesus said. One, when he was on the cross, he said, Lord, forgive them for not what they do. So even in the midst of his suffering, here's his words bring forgiveness here on the cross. But then here's what's more beautiful about it now. Right before he gave up his death, he says, it is finished. That's the power of God's word. In Genesis 1, he spoke life into existence. And here on the cross, he says here, and he says, it is finished, meaning that what God set out from beginning of time has come into be now and forevermore. Which means that his word, the living word, has the power to change course of life for us. It's living, it's active, sharper than any two-edged sword here. Speak the word of life over you. Cling to that. Sit at the feet of Jesus so that he can transform your life and all that is around you. Ask the God that we serve. That's the beauty of this here because the Bible tells us how beautiful are the feet of those who carry the good news. Don't ever stop speaking life to people. And I'm talking God's word. And don't ever stop speaking it to them and don't stop speaking it to yourself. So what? So a few things to wrap this up. Control the tongue. Here's the thing, we're, going, we're being transformed like Christ. Second Corinthians chapter three, it tells us 18, it says with unveiled faces, my God, beholding the glory of the Lord. We are being transformed from one degree of glory to the next for this is the Lord of the spirit. And in John, 1 John 3, 3, and everyone who hopes in him purifies himself, he is pure. God is and will transform you now. You are getting a glimpse of what eternity will be like now when you submit to the Lord, when you give your tongue to him, when you do exactly what it says in Psalm 41, uh, 141.3. Set a guard over my mouth, O Lord. Keep watch over the doors of my lips. You hear me say it all the time when I end a prayer. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. That's God's word. Be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Those are the things that we need to pray. Set a guard, God. Let my mouth be honoring to you. And let what I meditate be pleasing to you. Because it's going to come out, Lord. And do not forget that the Lord is transforming you each and every day. So when you mess up in a conversation, when your speech is out of bounds, go apologize, repent, own what you need to own. And then submit your conversation to the Lord. Before you step into a conversation, God, help my mouth to be guarded. This is going to be intense now. I feel in a certain way. You can go in and do it by the power of the Spirit. The Bible is very clear. No human being can tame the tongue. But God can. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. It empowers us to be able to live God's word. Remember, there is death and life in the power of the tongue. And I, my heart, my prayer for you as your pastor is that you get this. That we be a church. That people would say, man, these people are really kind here. Not perfect. But when they walk through the doors, 
when they don't know someone, when they have a conversation, when they come in here, when they stay after, my prayer is that we will be a church that is marked by, get this, speaking the word of God in love and caring for people more than someone saying, I encounter somebody with a foul attitude. 